Sometimes people make history by accident. They do something and it turns out to be significant. Margaret Bush Wilson knew what she was doing was important. She knew the struggle had started before she came along and would continue after she was gone. The lawyer and civil rights activist passed away this summer at the age of 90. And over the years, we had interviewed her a number of times because we thought she had a lot to tell us. I'm, I'm, I'm leery of violence because it leaves a lot of scars and sometimes it doesn't really solve things. I interviewed Margaret Bush Wilson in her law office in 1998 for a documentary on St. Louis history. Five years later, she joined Alvin Reed and me at Blueberry Hill on the program In the Loop. St. Louis has all this potential for greatness, and it's just goofing off. You're goofing off? <laughs> and I'm so, I'm so upset. What's, what's the key to St. Louis finally rebounding and getting it going in the right direction? Do I dare say it? Go ahead and say oh, it. Oh, yeah, that's why we're here. Stop fighting the Civil War. Okay, well, both sides or just both one side? Side. Both I sides. Both sides. Yeah. Say so that fight is over, huh? Well, the one thing about you, I think, that... Um, that you've done is you have worked within the power structure. Yes, I, mean, you worked in I City believe Hall. in doing that. In the 1970s, she became the first woman to chair the National Board of the NAACP, an organization she'd been part of practically her whole life. As a child in the 1920s, she was growing up in a legally segregated city and state, and she was also growing up with parents who did not accept the status quo. My mother and father were early members of the NAACP when I was a little girl. But unlike now, NAACP was considered a very dangerous organization back then. And people, particularly in the South, kept their membership secret. Her father was a real estate broker and he was the man who helped a black family buy this house on Labadee in a white neighborhood. That led to the Shelley versus Kramer decision in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that whites only restrictive covenants were unenforceable. Many of the lawyers who were involved in these landmark decisions of the 1930s and 40s, like the NAACP's Thurgood Marshall, had come from segregated black law schools. It seems to me that if you segregate people, if you, if you take all the bright black law students and you put them all in their own one building you're just asking for trouble well that's, that's what happened that's what happened at Howard you see I mean that the Howard University just turned out class after class of kids who went right back home started suing people to <laughs> let them in <laughs> and they were also going out to teach the next generation of black lawyers including her where did you go to law school you mentioned just from high school that, to law school tell us that, that story. That's, a, that's another interesting <laughs> <All story. right. laughs> I went to Lincoln University School of Law, which is now merged with the University of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And you know that story. Yeah. The story is that the Missouri State Legislature very quickly set up a new Negro law school in the old Poro building in North St. Louis, so it would not be forced to admit blacks to the University of Missouri Law School in Columbia. Margaret Bush Wilson would be in the new school's second graduating class. One week and I knew I'd stumble on my calling. I loved it. I really loved it. And I think it was because we used case books. So even though they're boring, you can always say to yourself, this happened to somebody. This really happened. And I think that was the reality of it that I found fascinating. And I think segregation, more than just separation, never lets either side know what your capabilities are. See, I had never had a chance to go to school with white kids, so I didn't know, you know whether I was bright as they or not until I finished law school. Took a civil service exam for lawyers, passed in the top three, and then got hired. And I said, oh, wow. And I sat up straight <laughs> and said, great. And, and it wasn't that I, you know, I, I was, but this, this, is, this shouldn't happen in this country. People should be intermingling so that we are comfortable with each other and know each other as human beings and their strengths and weaknesses. Her practice would focus on real estate and business law, but her legal training would guide her in the battle for civil rights. 
and I know something about the history of the development of the law and the rule of law. And I know that the opposite of that is anarchy. And I don't want any part of anarchy, and I don't want any part of absolutism where one king or one czar or whoever runs everybody else. This is the best of both worlds. And we have to do it through the rule of law. And so I'm not ever going to be violent. And I told him I'm not going to go to jail either. I mean, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I'm not, can't, I, can't, I will get you out of jail. <laughs> That's what I told Marion Oldham. I'm not going to jail, but I'll get you out. Her friend Marion Oldham was one of those who was arrested after the Jefferson Bank sit-in in 1963. Protesters were demanding the hiring of black bank tellers. This was organized by CORE, the Committee on Racial Equality. And after its leaders were arrested, Margaret Bush Wilson, who was state NAACP president, immediately started calling African-American attorneys throughout the city. Jefferson Bank was a fascinating example of cohesion among black lawyers because that case mobilized all of us. And on that first day in Judge Michael Scott's courtroom, the walls were lined with black lawyers. <laughs> it was very interesting. The legal battle and the bank protests kept up, and early the following year, Mayor Tucker's Employment Commission announced that since the previous summer, local banks had hired 84 Negroes into office clerical and training positions. And throughout the city, more than a thousand blacks had been hired or put into training programs by all kinds of companies. Thirteen of them had never before hired a black worker. And, and I can remember, and it's just to show you how young people, without knowing history, without understanding, have a perception. I wandered into then the Bank of St. Louis. This must have been about 10 years after Jefferson Bank. And they were celebrating the 10th anniversary, and I saw this attractive young man of color behind the counter, this nice tie on, looking very... And I said, oh, I'm so glad to see you. I said, I suppose you're going to the Jefferson Bank celebration. He said, no. Nope. I said, no. <laughs> he said, no. I said, yeah, but, you know, you're here because of that. And he said, no. Nope. I got this job on my own. I got this job on my own. <laughs> and I just nodded and I said, yes. Some take the heat so others can enjoy the treat. In this turbulent time, there were public protests, courtroom battles, and there were also private negotiations. Like what happened after years of persistent protests at St. Louis restaurants, which served only whites. The Restaurant Association was just upset and concerned. And they called me and asked for a meeting. And I agreed to go. I'll never forget, it was a meeting over in, on Market Street somewhere in one of the buildings along there. And I walked in and here were all these restaurant owners around and myself. I didn't take anybody with me, I went by myself. And there was a photographer there. And I've never seen the picture, maybe I should go find get that picture. <laughs> anyway, we all sat down and the photographer said to me, would you move aside so I can take the picture? And everybody in the room groaned <laughs> because he had just... <laughs> and then one of the fellows said, she's the most important person in the room, please. <laughs> At any rate, we sat there and talked. And they agreed around that table that they would quietly open if we would agree to stop the picket. And this was before the public accommodations law was passed by the city. And then thereafter, the public accommodations bill passed. The civil rights movement has had phases, of course. But the struggle has been there ever since, um, well, you know, even, bef even before uh, the Civil War. There was something called the Underground Railroad. And that to me is a dimension of the Civil Rights Movement, clearly. 
and it is in many ways a splendid example of what I think we must seek in this country because there were not only black people trying to uh, be free, but there were people of other colors and white people who were helping them. I have a notion that this country has all this potential for greatness. It's a, it's a marvelous country. We have all these different races here. We've got, you know, and and quiet as it's kept, we haven't begun to to be the kind of people we can be.